Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And with us here, the government's new culture minister, who has an economics degree, founded her own business before becoming an MP, Margot James. The former Labour Health Secretary who left Parliament in 2016 to run and become Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Uh, a government advisor and Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, formerly. Now Chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, Howard Davis. The arts and culture advisor, Munira Mirza, who's worked for the Tate, the Royal Opera House, and for Boris Johnson as one of his deputy mayors, and the screenwriter and film director, who won an Oscar for the film Milk, Dustin Lance Black. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as you well know, if you want to take issue, which I'm sure you do watching this program because it drives people crazy, you can do it at home using our hashtag BBCQT on either Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, let's have our first question. It comes from James Burke, please. James Burke. Who should be held accountable for the collapse of Carillion and uh, what action should, should they face? Right. We've had more questions on this than anything tonight. So who should be held accountable for the collapse and what action should they face? Margot James. I think that you have to hold the directors accountable. You have to hold, hold the senior management accountable. And I think um, that they will face um, a great deal of opprobrium. And if, um, as the government has in, is set in place an inquiry through the insolvency service, um, if they have been found to be negligent uh, or worse, um, they will, I hope, um, receive uh, the, the very heaviest punishment possible. What do you think they did wrong? <laughs> well, I think uh, they... I mean, I may, I may be able to just say that we don't know yet exactly what went wrong, and, and perhaps um, my words are assuming uh, wrongdoing, and perhaps, you know, they've got to be given a fair hearing. And I, and I did make the point that there has to be an investigation and the insolvency service will do that. Um, but I think that uh, certainly over the last 18 months or so, large dividends and large bonuses were paid um, at a time when surely the board must have been aware uh, that um, they were having difficulties getting paid on time, they had a great deal of mounting debt, um, and obviously they thought they could steer themselves out of it, and in fact, the week before everything went wrong, but finally, um, the, the share price was, was recovering, so even the market obviously thought they were going to survive, but it wasn't an environment in which they should be paying the bonuses that they were paying, um, and I think that uh, right. they are culpable of that at the very least. All right. Um, Howard Davis, this is a tricky one for you, because you chair RBS, and you were in, very much involved in this, and stopped lending them money at some point. But what's your answer to the question, which was who should be held accountable and what action should they face? Well, the Margot's right <coughs> that it is the directors who must be ultimately responsible. Um, but she's also right to say that we shouldn't jump to the conclusions about whether they are guilty of some kind of criminal offence or fraud or anything. What you have to look at is whether um, they were properly representing the financial position of the company. And the Financial Conduct Authority is investigating that. In other words, when they made their profits, warnings, etc., did they properly describe the position of the company in a way that market investors and borrowers and others could You mean they could be understand? pulling the wool over the government's eyes all the time? Uh, they, well, it, I don't governments. think it was necessarily the government, but it could have been the government, but it would also have included shareholders. I mean, were they accurate in describing the financial position of the company? That is the main question that needs to be asked. OK. Let's hear from some... There's a lot of questions on this. There's a woman there in the middle. Yes. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, what went wrong with the company, but my question is, is more, you know, why did Chris Grayling award them billion-pound contracts after 
there had been a profits warning and a drop in share price. Okay. You know, I think that's the question of the time. <laughs> that we want to okay. Andy Burnham. Well, I think absolutely uh, that's the question, isn't it? The question the government has to answer. Why they gave the company not just that contract, I think three other major contracts after profits warnings have been issued. So there are big questions for the government to answer. Margot and Howard are right. Of course, the directors, the senior management. When, when did it become acceptable for people to pay themselves sky-high salaries while pushing companies to the brink and putting thousands of people's jobs at risk? When did that become <laughs> acceptable? So, I would say the company needs to be held accountable to answer the question. The government does too, but actually, let's be honest, all politicians too, because we've allowed a situation to develop here where people can behave uh, in this way, where they can pay themselves these performance-related, exorbitant salaries and bonuses, while basically stripping away the security of people working in those companies day to day. The whole culture is wrong. We've all allowed it to grow over the years, and it now needs to change. Well, no. Yes, no, the woman there, yes, you. Um, we're asking why the government carried on supporting Carillion and giving them contracts. Could it possibly be that our government and our civil servants are so distracted by Brexit that they weren't actually keeping their eye on the ball? Um, uh, right. Justin, what do you think? Well, I, I, that's a big question I have on a lot of issues. Uh, and, and let me be clear, I, I'm here from the United States of America. I didn't get to vote on Brexit. I, I'm here in this country because I fell in love and because I call it home and I hope to raise a family here. So I really do give a damn about how this country does. And time and again, it seems like no one's got their eye on the ball. Who's at the wheel of the ship? Who is, and I love the audience member who used the word accountability. I think at the point at which government says we are going to take these programs uh, private, you can't keep blaming the private company. Private companies are built on profit. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to make a profit. Well, that's not what the state is supposed to do. That's not what the government is supposed to do. The government is supposed to be looking out for the people, for you. Okay. And so when I, when, I, when I hear accountability, I say, go to the government who gave this company these jobs. Make sure they knew how many jobs they were giving this company. How many eggs did they put in that basket? And were they keeping a close enough eye with so much going on to make sure they didn't do something that was going to help the fortunes of a few and hurt your families? Okay. Their government is a country. Munir, I'll come to you, but do you want to just answer him? Yes. Just um, yes. I mean, I think what I would say um, to that is that um, government does not have a monopoly on the skills it takes to deliver complex public services well uh, at all. Um, the voluntary sector has a role, the private sector has a role, and yes, the government has a role. Um, and we want the best of British talent engaged in this pursuit. And you don't get that by being too um, dictatorial about whether we should all be private or it should all be public. It should be a mix. But what we're looking for is quality and choice. But loads and loads, shed loads yes, of stuff yeah, given to it, yeah, not just by your government, by Labour government as well. That is true. And there are several large companies that are capable of taking on big contracts, and Carillion was one of them. But I would take issue with people who um, feel that somehow the government is at fault for giving them the business. I mean, the government has been aware of issues at uh, Carillion and is taking a very close view on all of these big companies and has been engaged in contingency planning for, you know, quite some time. Um, and what that do you is, mean, well, contingency planning? Well, like, giving I'll tell them you contracts, I... like grayling was mentioned, giving them a contract. Where did you, where did you oh, do the... What contingency oh, well, planning I, was I, that? I, Sorry. I will answer yes, your question. Make, 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 <laughs> make, make the point again. You know, where's the due diligence? It just seems, it, it just seems like they, well, it see, yeah, I have to question whether Chris Grayling was actually acting on behalf of the taxpayers or the shareholders. That's what you left questioning. I can answer that. OK, let, 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 let Margaret just briefly yeah. finish her well, answer. What, what I would answer is Chris Grayling is absolutely acting in the interests of taxpayers 
And what I was about to say was the due diligence was really carefully controlled when the government um, identified the need to have joint ventures bidding for these contracts so that if there was a failure, at least there's another company of right. sufficient size. And all those contracts that you're talking about, certainly in the last year, have been, the big ones have all been with other companies involved as well who've, who are now going to take up the responsibility so you're not of delivery. Nobody's, nobody's going to lose a job, no apprentice is going to be out of work, nobody's going to be I, hurt by this collapse? I mean, I think the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest um, detriment, actually, is going to be the SMEs, the small businesses, in the supply chain of those big companies. Mm. Those are the people, I think, that, you know, if they had too much business with Carilli, and I, I really do feel for them, because right. it will be very, very difficult for M them. Manira. The, the jobs will be there for, to be done. They'll just be done for another company. Manira. I think the, the, the original question, which is who should be held to account, uh, really, who's to blame for this happening. Clearly, the, the managers at Carillion uh, uh, messed up, and there were decisions made in government, uh, which I think uh, should be investigated and questioned. But there is a bigger problem that's been revealed by the collapse of Carillion, which is about how government procurement has been working for the past 20 years, and the fact that uh, the public finance initiatives, public uh, private partnerships, have been dysfunctional for a long time. Uh, the, Companies like Carillion, Carillion is not the only one, which have been limping along with very poor management that have been effectively propped up by the state. Uh, they've been given contracts which really uh, they were not equipped to deliver. They weren't delivering quality services. And this isn't an argument against privatisation. I'm not dogmatic about whether we use private companies. I've been involved in public procurement and very often private companies bring specialist expertise. Uh, they're very efficient. They can be cheaper to use than doing things in-house. So I don't have a kind of ideological uh, uh, opposition to using private companies. But I think that government has allowed this very uh, mediocre sector of companies to grow up around it. And what we really need is government to have a completely different mindset, a much more robust, uh, much more insistent on innovation, on efficiency. Uh, and in fact, that's what happened with Carillion in the last year. Because government got better at negotiating its contracts, mm. Carillion stopped making as much profit as it was used to. And in a way, something went right. A company was finally exposed for being very weak. It's no comfort to the people who work for Carillion or the small businesses that have relied on it. But it does show that uh, it's important to, uh, to put these, uh, these companies uh, under greater scrutiny. OK. The man, man with the beard in the middle there. You, sir. Hasn't um, Carillion... Um, and given a lot of money to the Conservative Party. I don't know what the exact amount is, but I think that's why the Carillion wasn't allowed to fail, was it? Because it had been given a bung to the Tory party. That's why it's not been allowed to fail. Is that so, uh, Andy Byrne? Have you heard that? Well, there are connections between the two. I'm not coming on to try and score points and say that, oh, this means that they must have done special <laughs> favours for Carillion. All I would say is, I think, Minera said it, there must be a, a full investigation and those questions have to be asked. Because I was going to come back to the question like uh, from, from the woman over there who said, you know, why? Where, was the due diligence done? The question I would ask was, were they actually trying to prop this company up by giving these extra contracts? It looks a little like that uh, to me. So I think we, act, we have to have a, a full uh, process here where we turn over all of the stones, we look at all of the contact between ministers and the company, so that we can get to the bottom of this, because we are going to need to learn, <clears throat> put changes in place, and move forward in a different right. way after this. So, how, Davis, the allegation that Andy's making is the government deliberately propped up Carillion, even though they knew it was in difficulties, to see if they could keep it going? Is it, do you think there's any truth in that? I, is that how government I works? I find that difficult. Um, <clears throat> I'd be surprised, slightly, if that were the case. I can't answer that. What I can say is that it seems fairly clear that the problems that the company had arose primarily from the big construction contracts, not from the normal provision of sort of subcontracted services where we get people to go and deliver our catering for us. You know, it wasn't that. It was that they took on contracts under the private finance initiative. And here I think Munir is right on the button. I think the private finance initiative has been a fraud on the people because essentially... The government is always the cheapest borrower. The government can borrow more money more cheaply than anybody else. And therefore, if you're going to hand over the total provision of a big hospital to somebody whose borrowing costs are going to be higher than yours, you know, what is the advantage of doing that unless you're absolutely certain that they're going to be much more efficient? If you think they're going to be efficient, why don't you give them a fixed-price contract? Why hand over the whole thing? I think PFI 
has been a fraud and there's been a very interesting report by the National Audit Office today which just shows just how much we have paid for the privilege of getting a private finance initiative which was designed to take stuff off the government's balance sheet so the government could pretend that it was doing more in the way of public services than it really was. And this was That's go, the go, uh, did John Major. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 Howard, if you're right, I mean, John Major began, began yeah. this. Gordon Brown did it with knobs on, with it. supercharged, yes. it, yeah. and it's been going on ever since. Why yeah. did nobody say what you're saying at the time? Well, I mean, people I, have for a long time complained I, I about it. You, I I mean, you, you did some, didn't yeah. you? It, they, when you, you were saying that people, people, people were, people were uh, yeah. saying Look at the things. I think Howard's right. So let's, <laughs> let's go back to how this began. The old ways of building public infrastructure hadn't worked. So by the early 90s, the country had crumbling infrastructure. Uh, so Howard is right. The Treasury wanted a way of building a lot without it being on the balance sheet. That's where this. Why didn't uh, they came want it on? The, people say this on the balance sheet. You, what you mean? You, you didn't want so to the look as they borrowing were borrowing. The requirement wasn't. It looked uh, as okay. if the government was borrowing too much, and that they feared yeah. would push the so, government so debt. And so that was it, yes, mm. began under Major, but absolutely continued under the Labour government. And I can remember being a minister where you know, there were, there's a need to rebuild hospitals, and for us it wasn't a choice of a PFI hospital or a public hospital. It was a PFI hospital or no hospital. So in those circumstances, obviously, you know, we had hospitals that weren't up to standard, schools with leaky roofs. I mean, as, as ministers, we were working in that climate. I look at it now, and yeah, they weren't all bad deals, by the way. I mean, some of them produced facilities that have been providing better services for the public in those communities since they were built. Well, but but many long. of them were poor value for money. And that's why I say the time has come to draw a line and move forward. Well, could I... Could... Can I just answer that a minute, Andy? I mean, you were in government all that time. Um, it, there wasn't nobody that was decreeing that you couldn't build hospitals in the traditional treasury-financed way. That was a decision your chancellor took. And that's when, you, uh, when the Gordon Brown got his hands on this PFI initiative, which was very judiciously used under the major governments, I might say, um, and then ran riot with it. I but mean, you absolutely never objected ran to right. it. But nobody ever objected to it. Well, was well going we changed on. it. You, I mean, if I'm allowed to prop, I've got the it. figures there. You can see the graph. We've, well, the, the dramatic decline in the use I'm of PFI under both the Conservative are to governments. Blame because we came into a position in 1997, more than half of the NHS predated the NHS itself. It was so old, it was crumbling. So it had to be rebuilt. And but I was why, saying, sorry, but, but you so it was rebuilt. But nobody no, but nobody said you had to use a PFI to do it. How Davis says, why couldn't you have borrowed money? Gordon Brown was very proud about his record on borrowing, and that was, a, that was an obsession. It was it, about getting transfer. rid of the old way, where people but, but, were waiting yeah, for right. hospitals, wait a second, to be delivered. There was a long queue. There was a, there was a history of projects overrunning and costing more than they, they said mm -hmm. they were going to cost. That's where it grew from. That, that was the time that we, we were living through. Let, okay. And it's now right to learn lessons from that, surely. Well, after how many years? The woman in white there in the middle, let's hear from you. Um, I'm a bit concerned you're talking about all these big governments. What about the people at the bottom of the, the pile, the people doing the cleaning in the hospitals, people that are providing the food? They, they've lost their jobs, some of them, and it's very hard to get another job. So how are you going to address all those people that have lost their jobs when they could go back to the NHS and the NHS could take over quite successfully as they did before? Mm. I mean, we often find they that should. private companies don't give us the service that... Um, the NHS did. We don't get food at night as nurses. We, there's no canteen. The cleaning, they've got different people, whereas in the old NHS, they did have people that are proud of their job and they did it well. So I feel concerned that we're talking just, at a higher level and we're yeah. forgetting mm. the common people. Just, just oh, explain. explain. <laughs> yeah. Can you just briefly explain your experience of this? You obviously work in the NHS. Yes, do you? I do. What, and, uh, I mean, years ago, there was food 24 hours a day. There isn't now. And you talk about obese nurses. The government are really clumping down on this 40% this of obese nurses. Well, actually, we can't get hold of decent food because there isn't any when we're on shift. Because the servicing is There's no mm -hmm. service. OK. The man there in... The, in, in yes, you, sir. Me? Yep. Um, I, th I think it's disgusting to hear party politics blaming each other. The, the whole thing about Carillion, um, it was a few years back... Governments used to put out contracts to lots of little people or organisations, etc. Then they made a decision to make it more effective to just put out a contract to one body or a few bodies. That's what's happened here. 
that Carillion was made up of a lot of individual small companies that were brought together, and it was the company, it was the, the it was Andy Burnham and you, madam, that, that together you are equally to blame. And I think it's disgusting to hear you arguing when you really should get together and, and really look at your policies um, and, 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 and do something about them. Can I... Can I... Yes, yes. Can I... I, I think you've made an absolutely spot on point because what's happened is the, the, the PFI, the, uh, the privatisation uh, mantra was all about trying to introduce more entrepreneurial thinking, more innovation, more competition so that you wouldn't have these state monopolies which were very inefficient. And actually what's happened over the last 20 years is that the state has simply recreated its image in the private sector. So you've got these companies, these very large companies that always bid for contracts, always win. The regulation that they lobby for crowds out smaller businesses, newer businesses. And you haven't got the kind of dynamic, competitive, innovative uh, 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 kind of services that, that you would hope for. And I think that's the racket that needs to be revealed. When you say they're not competitive... Do you think Carillion wins on price? Or on efficiency? Or on quality? What does it win on? I, th I think you can have companies... I think you can have large companies that offer economies of scale. But too often they are... Too often they are yeah, given the deal because they are the lowest bid. And I don't think the public sector should always give the contract to the cheapest bid. I think it should think about okay. value for money for quality. It should think about how it treats its workers. It should think about how innovative, how productive a service is. And for too long, Carillion had survived. Corruption at our highest level in government. And government should look at itself and get rid of that at that image. All right. The, the man here I was pointing at, you, sir. Uh, I think, uh, as a start, I think the, the whole process of PFI is quite deceitful because, in, in many ways, it is simply concealing the amount that the government is borrowing. <laughs> And, and putting up with a huge additional cost, because obviously there's a lot of people in the, in the chain of events, not just from the point of view of building it, but once it's built, you've then got to run the place, and there are fixed costs for so many of these items, which leaves, for instance, the NHS in Hereford short of money, which it could and should be spending on nurses and their food and their wages. What are they spending it on instead? They're spending it on the PFI contract, mm. which is so generous. Yeah. Now, Andy said earlier sure. there was a choice of a PFI hospital or no hospital. And I think that's ridiculous, because if they could afford to rent a hospital for the next 30 years on a fixed price, on an inflation-linked contract, it would have been I... so much cheaper for the government to simply mm. borrow that money at, as Howard said, a much lower rate, and then it would have been able to afford the other things we'd presently well, can't I afford. I agree with you, and, I, and I, was, I was saying that the choice we were given was the wrong choice. We shouldn't have been told PFI or, or no hospital. Well, I, who I, told you that? Well, that was the Treasury. That was no, the, the Treasury. Yourself. Treasury officials no, no, have never the liked the PFI. I was a Treasury well, official myself. Really? They've never it, liked PFI. There will be many instances where there was no other alternative. It was that. I'm just telling you, that was my experience uh, being in government. Well, at let's that, try and sort this out. Howard Davis says that, he, that he's never, ever heard, any, and he was a deputy governor of the Bank of England. It wasn't England. a capital know. budget he, enough to go around and build every hospital everywhere. Who told you you had to do it that way? Was it your chance for the Exchequer, yes. Gordon Brown, or was it the Treasury? It was, it was both. It was no. Gordon Brown and Gordon. the Treasury <laughs> policy. I mean, that's, that, that, that was the, yeah. the world that we were living in. But I just want to come back to the gentleman's point. I mean, you're right, both parties are to blame uh, here. Right. And I also think that the other lady was right, you know, that the idea that cleaners well, and porters... Being right now. Well, I'm just going <laughs> to explain. We're then separated away from the team on the ward. I just want to make a, a point of, that I did as health secretary. I changed Labour policy on outsourcing in 2009 to make the public NHS the preferred provider. Because I'd lived through those years, these years, Howard, I'd been through those years, and I myself couldn't support it anymore. So when I had the chance, I said the public NHS should be the preferred provider of services. And I got cold-shouldered by many people in government at that time because that's what I believed. And I still believe it, and I think Jeremy Corbyn is right to, today to say the public sector now should be the default provider of public services. Okay. Thank you. concern lies with the tens of thousands of small businesses that have been affected by this. Um, as a small business owner myself, albeit not affected by the Carillion liquidation, I know how hard it is. Um, these small businesses employ people, th these mm. people have mortgages, they have families, 
And, you know, I heard the other day that some of these businesses are going to have to wait for years before they find out if they've got any recourse or compensation, and that's disgusting. You I know, why right. can we not have a, a, an instant decision or at least not leave we, it for years before these businesses get their money? Well, the, the banks have tried to do something. I don't, I don't want to just blow my own bank's jump because the others have done the same today, have announced a sizable amount of money, in our case, 75 million, Santander have done about the same, I think, um, of money which is available to support small businesses through a period when they're not going to get paid by mm. Carillion. I think that's, you know, the least we can do, frankly, in the circumstances, and I hope that helps. That's good. That's really good. That's the point I want to make about SMEs. How, 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 do, you, how do you do that? I mean, you, 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 well, you, we, you're lenders anyway. Yeah. I mean, you're, no, but you know. we, we, we will um, give people, we will lengthen people, exp increase people's overdrafts. Um, we will lengthen the terms of their loans. Uh, we will allow them to invoice factoring, a whole variety of things we will do, but which allow them to keep in business mm. and not to have to go under because Carillion are not paying their It's contracts. a change of policy for the mm. Royal Bank of Scotland because they used to love basket cases. <laughs> they, they used to say you can make money out of people who are in real trouble, didn't you they? Can't, you can't resist a cheap <laughs> shot, David, can you? Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm quoting a Treasury Select Committee. I'm not using a oh. cheap <laughs> shot. It was before you were chairman, but rope, Thank you. sometimes you need to let customers hang themselves, the Royal Bank of Scotland said. Yeah. Oh. It's, uh, that is extremely, extremely embarrassing. And um, <laughs> um, it is, no, I mean it seriously, it's, it's, it's humiliating when I discovered that that had been said in 2009. You know, you wonder where, you wonder where to put yourself. Um, I hope we've changed the culture now. Good. Well, Good. now you're well, lending s how, many, how many million? 75? 75. Well, this is an, a specific okay. pot for small businesses who are in trouble Can I as a okay. contractor. OK, on well, we ha Howard Can Davis, I RBS, you've said it here on Question Time. Can I ask... Can queue I up oh. afterwards. <laughs> yes. B briefly, yes, we must um, move on. Well, I just wanted to actually um, ask Howard, uh, one of the tragedies of all this is that the smaller building companies, even those with really good long track records, cannot get normal finance. Um, and the government have made some steps in order to guarantee loan facility and that sort of thing. But what can we do with banks to get building companies that are of, a, of a smaller size to be able to get the credit in order to compete more effectively in this market? Because, goodness me, you know, Carillion had the credit, but the smaller SMEs in that sector fight like hell to try and get credit, and they can't get it. OK. Well, we... we... We leave that one hanging because we, we must go on because we've got many other questions. Uh, just before we take another one, I should say we're going to be in Dumfries uh, next week and the week after that we're going to be in Grantham. If you want to make a note of how to get to the programme, there's a telephone number and the uh, email address of how to get to us. Let's take this question from Antonia Hastings. I rather wonder whether you change your name by Dean <laughs> Pohl to ask this question, Antonia. I would, I would but let's deny hear it. that, David. You deny, deny it. OK, it. let's hear the question, and I'll <laughs> leave it to the audience to decide. <laughs> Is £44 million good value for the loan of the Bayer Tapestry, or is it the stitch-up? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, Manira. Well, I'm very pleased that the bio tapestry is coming, and I think it's exciting and wonderful. Uh, and uh, clearly, Macron is uh, very pleased about his grand Napoleonic gesture, it's the, which he likes to do. Um, in terms of the, the actual serious business of uh, paying towards the border security at Calais, I think it's right that the UK contributes. Uh, it clearly is an issue for us as well as for France. And uh, like. Uh, like many of these things, it's about cooperation. Uh, I think what's interesting about today and, and the summit is that it shows that we can uh, have cooperation and friendship with our allies in Europe. We don't have to be a member of the European Union. I did support Brexit, and I would like us to continue um, with that relationship. And uh, I think £44 million pounds is, you know, is a reasonable amount. It's not the first amount, first time we've paid towards uh, uh, security at Calais. We've, we, I think we spent about £100 million in the last... Uh, three years. So um, I think it's right that we do that. Okay. Dustin. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, it's wonderful that, that we're going to be able to share art. Uh, I'm an artist. I, I can't wait to see it. Uh, but I also think that uh, folks in this country need to get used to paying these sorts of amounts and more. 
Um, and, you know, I didn't have an opportunity to vote on Brexit, but clearly now there are going to have to be these unilateral relationships between different countries that you didn't used to have to do that with. Uh, we're going to have to see this country reach out and, and create these relationships and these friendships with other countries, and it, the price tag is likely going to be very high. Uh, I don't know if we've answered the question yet uh, in the negotiations of whether these new price tags are going to be worth it. Uh, I'm very curious to see what this deal is going to look like with Brexit. Uh, I hope, as someone who's going to call this home, that it's a very good deal, but I'm going to be equally shocked if it is, I have to say, the way things are going. Yes. Uh, and, and I do, I'll, I'll leave it here and get very controversial for just a second. I hope that once this deal is done and I say, go make a good deal, I want there to be a good deal if we have to do this. But if the deal is a stinker, let the people have a voice. Okay. Okay. Back to the bio tapestry and 44 million. Look, look there, yes. I'm just wondering what we should lend to okay. France in exchange. Perhaps a DVD of The Darkest Hour? <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my answer is we should, I, lend, I, we should give them Arsene Wenger. <laughs> <laughs> which would be very popular with referees. <laughs> Howard Davis. Uh, well, I think that we have to um, make a contribution in Calais. I think probably, perhaps because I, I sort of read the, the French press from time to time, um, I think people in this country don't quite understand how serious an issue the problem in Calais has been for the French. Um, and that area around Calais um, has been a very strong national front area, uh, and that's partly because of the existence of the camps, it was called the jungle. Um, and now we can say, you know, that that's not our fault, but actually the UK has been the magnet and that's what's been pulling people there. So I do think that if we want the French to keep the border on the other side, I think it's reasonable for them to expect us to make a contribution. The one thing I would add, however, is that it does seem to me that the whole problem of migration must be dealt with at European level. These are people who come in to one European country, often Italy, they get through to France and they want to come here. The idea that we can kind of deal with this just on our own seems implausible to me. I think there has to be a collective approach to the problem of economic migration into Europe. And do you, do you think he played a blinder with the Bayer tapestry? <laughs> didn't, didn't that was expected? Uh, I think he is a very uh, cute character, Macron. Uh, a cute indeed. character. Huh. Um, cute. Uh, I think cute, he's a great uh, showman. Cute, cute yeah. in the sense of, um, you know, thinking of smart little ideas. Yeah. Um, many, many people say it's his wife, actually, who thinks up these ideas, but well, I wouldn't like to be <laughs> certain about that. But no, I think it's a good, a good gesture, and I think it's, um, you know, I think people feel good about it. Okay. The, the woman there. I, I think it's an a absolute bargain, and, but I also think that... Um, Britain is feeling very small and very lonely and a little tiny island and we need all the friends we can possibly get. So um, bring over the tapestry. We can send the crown jewels back to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the uh, person who was seen on television holding them so tenderly would be very <laughs> pleased about that. The man in pale blue there. Isn't the delivery of the tapestry really just a poke in the eye by Macron um, in advance of the negotiations uh, in, in Brexit uh, in relation to um, the forthcoming um, uh, trade negotiations? It's a poke in the eye. Uh, OK, Margot, Margot James. Oh, I think it's a wonderful gesture, actually, and I really look forward to seeing it. Um, I mean, it is said to have been embroidered in Canterbury, um, so it's a moot point as to where its origins lie. I think it's a wonderful gesture anyway. Um, and I think the money uh, is a necessary investment. I agree with Howard um, about um, the, uh, you know, the, the pressures on that part of northern France have been intense and we do need to make a contribution. And, and the money will be spent you know, on new technology, on state-of-the-art fencing, it's a sad situation. Um, you're talking about a lot of human misery that has caused this whole issue. But um, I think, you know, British people are quite clear. Mm -hmm. We do need to control our borders, and this is a very necessary investment in that process. Andy Burnham. Mm -hmm. Well, if it was 44 million just for a, a, a tapestry, that clearly wouldn't be good value for money. And I don't know whether 44 is, is the right figure, but 
Clearly, the money, as Margot just says, does address a shared problem, and the border in Calais is a shared uh, problem, as other panellists have said, and it's right to, to work with them. Maybe the 44 million then therefore buys a better relationship, a thawing of relations, and I think we need a bit of that, don't we? A bit less of the, the Johnson and Gove rhetoric and a bit more uh, uh, reaching out across the channel and uh, building those uh, relationships. And maybe, therefore, that will get us... The 44 might help us get a more balanced, sensible uh, Brexit, uh, where, we, yes, we must deal with the concerns the public expressed around uh, free movement, but by doing that, then maximise our access to the single market and to the customs uh, union. One thing that worried me was to hear the former French finance minister on the radio this morning saying that they may not be now so predatory about the City of London. Uh, what worries me about that is the whole thing is going to come to be about the City of London if we're not careful. You know, we live in a London-centric country, and my great worry as Mayor of Greater Manchester is that we're going to end up with a London-centric Brexit, where it's all about protecting the city of London and other industries in the regions mm. while well, they can pay the price. Well, I can mm. tell you now that will not be acceptable uh, to me and many other people uh, in the north of England. We need to see a fair deal for all of our industries all over the country. And as to what we might send back in return, well, I was just thinking about that. Some, something that will fit in there, something that maybe lacks a drink, sound of his own voice, and something whose name might suggest French ancestry. Let's send Nigel Farage back to... Uh, <laughs> can I make, a, can I make uh, a point as we're yeah. talking about this money to be spent on this border? Uh, just as someone who, who isn't from here, uh, and I know this great country has some issues. Who doesn't? You got some things to figure out. Who doesn't? But this country is a shining example of what is good in so many ways. Yeah. And I want to applaud both parties. I'm not from either party. On the work you've done along the way for inclusion, for acceptance of difference, uh, to make sure that some of the things I'm hearing my president back home say would not be acceptable here. Mm. But understand that some of these people who are in Calais trying to get here, they're not coming to try and steal from you no. or to ruin your culture. They're coming here because you're a giant, beautiful beacon of hope for them. Okay. And I hope that the government finds mm. it in their heart to spend some of that money to make sure that their conditions are livable there and to let some of them in to share their goodness with your greatness. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Yeah. Just, just before we leave this, uh, Howard Davis, what do you think the threat to the financial industry in Britain is? And what do you think about the way that the Brexit talks are going, from your standpoint as the chairman of one of the big banks? Yeah, uh, the position is um, not particularly good because where we've got to is a notion that we should build on the Canada relationship. You know, you know it was Norway or whatever. Um, and Canada, the Canada deal with um, uh, the European Union is basically about goods. It doesn't have any financial services or services components. So we would not get free trade and financial services out of a Canada deal. And that's the proposition that's sort of currently on the table. So I'm rather anxious um, about it. And I hope that we can, over the next few months, that the government will focus on building up from a Canada deal to include services. And that's not just about financial services, but London's exports of cultural services, media, law, etc., are very, very important to the country as a whole. Um, you know, I'm more of a Mancunian than Andy Burnham is, actually, who's a scouser, really. <laughs> um, and so I'm not being, having up. someone who's going to be more Mancunian <laughs> than me on this panel. This is not just about London. This is about the fact that Britain is a big service-exporting country, not just from London, and we've got to get a services deal as part of our negotiation. But we know that Macron wants to get as much of the banking as he can to Paris. We know the Germans would like to have it in Frankfurt or somewhere. Yes. Do you think London's going to be able to defend its corner? I think the London, city, let me call I it think that, London will remain the biggest the financial centre, but yeah. I think that there will be some rebalancing within Europe. I think that's an inevitable consequence of Brexit, which I regret. Um, but I think the task is to minimise that. But uh, I think, you know, the French finance chief uh, was on the radio this morning saying that Brexit is not going to be the catastrophe that a lot of people predicted it would be for the city. And I think what you're seeing in Macron is a president who knows how to negotiate. I mean, he's being very bullish. He's saying things like, we will steal your finance sector. Of course he is. That's exactly what you do when you represent your country in a negotiation. And I would like 
the leaders of this country to also be confident, to also make clear that there are certain things that we would like to see happen. And if we were talking about what we would want to send back in return for the bio tapestry, I suggest we send back the Magna Carta, which is about democracy. It's an, uh, an artifact of uh, historic importance to the world. And it will remind the EU that the reason that we're making this decision, that we're entering into these negotiations, is because a democratic vote was taken in this country. Okay. And people did ask <laughs> The woman there, yes. Yeah, and then I'll come to you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, we're talking about this £44 million bill yeah. for the tapestry, yeah. and we're talking about it in terms of really schmoozing up towards the trade negotiations for Brexit. So, is it, are you going to add that onto the price tag of Brexit? Okay, because evidently. It is related to it. You think and that's the not, motive? You think that's the motive think, of it? Do you? No, hold on. Yeah. These, these people let, have let, already suggested that that right. is part of the motive of it. Let, let so so if question. not, no, let can I just finish it? it? Oh, yeah, if, okay, if you're not prepared to do that, then can we know how many other little secret deals are going on <laughs> that are called something else but are actually... This is the price of Brexit. All right, Margaret, just briefly well, on that. Well, I, I mean, I don't... It isn't directly to do with Brexit. It is to do with the... And it's not just to do with the security at Calais either. Uh, there, are, there are other aspects of uh, our mutual relationship with France. Obviously, but partly um, but, it's you to know, do with that. I mean, security is... A, I mean, we're, we sort of interact with the French on so many levels. Defence and security are key. Uh, we're... But, both countries are the predominant defence uh, countries in terms of investment and spend across Europe. So we're working with the French with this money in just, northern France just, uh, and northern uh, Africa, where there's a huge amount of terrorist threat. So it isn't just about security at Calais. It's also about trafficking, trying to prevent right. trafficking. So there's a lot of things. Deal. It's just, not really just to, to add do with very Brexit. Quickly. There's, the British border has been in Calais for a number of years now, so we've actually had our border post in, in Calais, so the money is going to protect the British border. But I might just say, you know, we should challenge the French back, because I think they allow a fairly chaotic and unmanageable scene to kind of develop in Calais, where people are just left there trying to jump on uh, transport. That isn't acceptable to me, you know, they, they need to put things in place in Calais too, so it shouldn't just be asking us to, to fund it, we need clearer commitments from the French to, to look after people properly on their side uh, of the channel because at the moment I don't think they do that. Can I just clarify, right. I, Can I, just clarify? I, didn't, I, I don't think that we should not be spending this but I, sh I should think it should be called what it's called. You, you just want the sum to be added up yes. really and be open. Okay we must go on because we've only got 20 minutes left we've got many other questions well we won't get through them all uh, but we've got other questions we must go to so let's have uh, a question from Wendy Glinsky please. What should the government do about the hemorrhaging of nurses from the NHS? This is this week the head of the Royal College of Nursing said that the NHS is hemorrhaging nurses. One in ten left the profession in England in each of the last three years and half of them under the age of 40. Uh, Howard Davis. If you look at the numbers, it would appear that the big change over the last couple of years has been that we've now got European Union nurses going home rather than coming here. So it's been the change in the net number of European Union nurses has been more than all of the change in the net number of nurses coming into the NHS. Mm. And it would seem that part of that apparently, um, I can't quite believe this, was that some new language test was introduced, mm. um, which actually did mean that some people um, who could, would otherwise have got in, couldn't got in, including, as I read, um, an Australian nurse who was failed the English test. That doesn't surprise me, knowing a few <laughs> Australians. Um, but uh, I think that we do have to... Apparently, that's now been changed, and so maybe um, that will have an effect. But I do think that it's very important that we do convey the right message uh, to people coming into this country. We do need these nurses. We've been relying on quite a few EU nurses. And we ought to be clear, not that we have been dragged kicking and screaming to an agreement on migration as part of Brexit, <coughs> but that we actually want talented people uh, to come here um, and work in our uh, system. In what if sense is the signal not being sent out? Well, I think that the way in which we approached the issue of what the rights of EU citizens were going to be 
here was very grudging. It took about a year yeah. to get to the point where we accepted that the ones who were here and legitimately here and with the proper job and everything were going to be welcome. And I think that that was the wrong messaging. And I think we're seeing the price of that in the NHS. You're and nodding the vigorously the dialogue, around, the dialogue around Brexit, uh, even though it might not have represented what Brexit was about, the dialogue I was hearing on the street was so hateful toward people from other places. That couldn't be helpful. But I, I sort of want to ask the question uh, to, we have a nurse in the audience who asked a question earlier. What is it like to be a nurse right now? It's hard. I mean, the, the basic wage for a staff nurse is very difficult. If you're a young nurse, that's all right. And people coming abroad, they don't complain about that because it, they're young nurses. But once you've got a family who have been in nurse in 20 years, I mean, would you, any of you like to be earning 28,000 a year? Because the mortgage rate has gone up, the gas and electric, the food, have you everything. Had, have you had so, people in Hereford leaving? Uh, if you, are you in a hospital that, you, in Hereford? Yes. Yeah. A lot of them gone to agency and to the private hospital yeah. up the road. Uh, all right. It's better the, to pay the, the, yeah. Hold on a second. The woman here and pick, come back to you. Yeah. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm a, a, an NHS nurse, and I, I really don't entirely recognise what you're saying, because I know why, why nurses are leaving. Nurses are leaving the profession for exactly what that lady is saying, yeah. and nurses are leaving to go back abroad because they can't believe the conditions that they are working under in our wonderful NHS. I am so proud of my, my profession. You know, we work with our hearts and our hands and our heads, yeah. and we are not valued. We are losing money. Yeah, I think, I think that's the answer. I mean, one, one, one. As someone who grew up in a home uh, where a mom, my mom was in medicine, and I know how she was valued. And here, everywhere I go, I hear the same story, because I like to talk to people in the airports and the train stations, and I'm going around, and the nurses and the doctors are saying it's so incredibly difficult and unbearable, the conditions they've been put under here. And let me tell you, you don't want private medicine either. No. You don't. What you, need, right. what you need is a real investment in the infrastructure and a real investment in the NHS so that you have enough people that you can handle the workload, so you can have livable hours. So this looks like a job that people would want to have and they can raise a family and that's going to cost money. And it's going to take you guys making some tough decisions about where that money comes from. And I will say, as, as one last thing, as an American, I look at this country and I say, who's benefiting from this very healthy population, this beautiful thing that could be the NHS? And it's these corporations. It's these businesses that are coming here and they're reaping the rewards of all of you beautiful, healthy people. And okay. I want to make sure I would do an a in-depth examination to make sure they're paying their fair share for the rewards right. they're reaping so that you can have a better life. The woman in pink there, then I'll come to you. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm really saddened to hear that the cause of this hemorrhaging of nurses is put down to Brexit. I think that's a cop-out, quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It is due to a chronic lack of planning and foresight for um, our workforce for this country. We have no nurses because we have taken away the bursary. We are not supporting people going into education. We are not planning for the future, making sure we've got GPs, doctors, nurses, physios. We are, um, we, we are disregarding the NHS. And, um, so, and I agree with you, Justin, about the private enterprises coming in and reaping the rewards of the NHS, right. Virgin Horrible. being an example. All right. Well, there are a lot of points there. Uh, Margaret James, do you want to answer her? her? Well, I mean, you, the, the, the lady in blue there spoke very passionately from your personal experience. And, you know, I spend a lot of time with the local health service in my constituency in the borough of Dudley. And I, I would concede that morale is very low in parts of the NHS. And I understand what you've been saying and the, the other lady about pay. Um, although there is progression pay, um, once you get to a certain level, the, the pay advance um, is low. Um, and I know that, that, I mean, I was pleased that the Chancellor did um, at least relieve the public sector pay cap in the last budget. So there is some sign of hope on that front. Um, it, the issue of not enough places and poor planning, this is an old issue um, and certainly I think it transcends party lines actually because I, when I was in the NHS as a director of a trust 
nearly 20 years ago, we were so desperate for nurses that we were sending recruitment people out to the Philippines to attract people. So it's not even just nurses from the European Union. Um, and, and this has been an issue for a long time. But at least recently, um, there has been now funded places for 5,000 new training places, which is a 25% increase on last year. But this and one also, in ten leaving uh, over three years, yes, what about but, that? Um, well, is that going to make up for I that? Mean, I, as, as Howard said, um, whatever the cause of it, um, half uh, the, the number of foreign nurses that have been coming to the NHS that have been keeping the numbers going has halved in the last few years, and that has been more of an effect, effect actually than, than people leaving in terms of total numbers. But there's one more, one more point I'd like to make, which is that I'm, I'm very keen on the new nurse apprenticeship programme, um, which will give nurses a chance to train and work and learn and earn whilst they are going through their studies. I don't know, I do come back with, if you've got a different view, but that's, I think that is another route into nursing which should encourage people because there's not going to be any, any debt involved. They are going to be, um, they're going to be earning, right. learning yes. and... It's what, true uh, what you're saying, but you've got to have nurses there to teach them and they're going. Let me just give you an example. I know a nurse who has left just very recently, because she is earning a month £100 less than her 17-year-old son, who has no qualifications and is an apprentice. Okay. Isn't that a disgrace? All right, let me bring in some others. Right. There are many people here. Munira, you can give us. come to your different. Munira. I mean, I think it's absolutely clear that the NHS is struggling and it's struggling under the weight of the demand that's being placed on it. I don't think it's just about money. I do think the NHS needs more money, but there are other health systems around the world that spend similar amounts of money. But hang on, the when you say it's not about money, are you saying it's not about the salary that nurses no, get? No, no, no I, I do think the NHS should get more money, but I think that um, the way that the NHS is managed and the way it was designed originally was not to cope with the level of demand that we place on it now. The population has grown in the UK by about 5% over the last decade. That's placing significant demand in a way that was not originally imagined. But, but that doesn't and, answer uh, the pay question. She, no, no, she, no, no she I, do think, I do think nurses should get paid more. I do think we should value them. It's yeah, about gender. I, if nurses, if the majority of people working in the nurses' profession were males, then the salaries would not be capped at 28,000. You wouldn't have people like my sister looking to return to work from maternity leave, thinking, well, I'm not going to be any better off than if I was, you know, it's not, if women, if the majority of nurses were men, then 28,000 would not be the top right, salary, no. and it would not be so hard to get the job. Oh. I, think it's, I think it's about class. There are many men in this country that are on very low wages as well. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting argument. But it's, uh, I think it's... Uh, there, and there are many males working in the NHS, ho uh, hospital porters, for example, right. who let, let me pay badly. To... But, but, sorry, just to, right. just to finish my point, I think... Very often in the discussion about the NHS, it ends up being a political battle or a, a football um, between the political parties and, and each one has to declare its love for the NHS and how much money it's giving to the NHS. And what we don't have is an intelligent grown-up conversation about the kind of health service that we need for the 21st century. The fact that the demands placed on it are much greater, uh, the, the fact that we're getting older, the relationship to social care. And I think we just need to be prepared to... Uh, have some fresh ideas and thinking, and not so accuse people. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, the man up there. No, hold on a second. The man up there has been trying to get in you, so on the on the on the gangway. Me. Yes. Um, I think it's. Um, I think inevitably Brexit has demoralised a significant number of nurses who come from the European Union and have made an absolutely massive contribution to the NHS. And part of the exodus of thousands or tens of thousands of nurses leaving um, is attributable to that, coupled with the loss of the bursary. Yeah. All right, Andy, can you, can you, the question, the original, let me just restate it, because we, yep. we've been around, as always, on the NHS, a, a whole range of problems. But the question is, what should the government do about the hemorrhaging, and that's this week's report of yep. nurses? OK, uh, firstly, pay them more. It's just as simple as that. Because... Margot was right to concede that morale was low in response to those powerful contributions from the floor. Why is morale low? Because people, permanent staff, are on shifts next to agency staff being paid twice what they're being paid. And why are there so many agency staff? 
because the government has got its training policy wrong. They were cutting nurse training places a number of years ago. They've scrapped the bursary, as was acknowledged. That is entirely the wrong way to go. So they need to, I would say, restore the bursary. Let me tell you what I'm trying to do in Greater Manchester, because we have devolved responsibility. I want to look at nurse uh, development and training in the context of Brexit and the challenges it might pose. I want to grow more of our own young people to become NHS staff. I'm looking at an idea that if young people commit to the Greater Manchester NHS for five years after qualifying, that we might help pay off some of their tuition fees in response to have a better approach to helping young people come through. But actually, Munir is right. There's a, there's a deeper reason here. Why is there so much pressure on nurses? Go back to another layer of the care workforce, social care staff. They are even in an even worse position. They do 15-minute slots. They don't get the travel time between the 15 minutes, so they don't even get paid the national minimum wage. Social care in this country is utterly broken. Okay. I tried to fix it as health secretary. Since then, there's just been point scoring about it. In my view, and this again is what we're trying to do in Greater Manchester, it is time for social care fully to come within the public national health service. Mm -hmm. One service <laughs> in, in, this, in this 70th anniversary year, that is the way to renew the national health service for the century of the ageing society. One service covering people's physical, mental and social needs. And if you want one example where outsourcing really has in the worst kind of capitalism. It is in social care, where older people have seen services utterly uh, slashed and there's been profiteering on the backs of the most vulnerable people in our society. OK. A quick... <laughs> quick, if, quick, if you would, because we're coming towards the end. Um... What I don't understand is there is so much public support to put more money into our NHS, to pay our nurses more, to support our nurses and reinstall the bursary programme, because if you're going to be a nurse and you're going to qualify earning less than £30,000 a year, but you ended up in so much debt with such high interest rates to pay, why would you do it? It doesn't make any sense. And I wonder if, you know, the Conservative government that we have is ideologically making the NHS underfunding it, so then they can make the argument for privatisation. You'll have to be, Margaret, you'll have to be very brief in your, in your well, answer. I, I'm in very food. sorry there's such enthusiasm for what you've said, because it is utterly untrue. <laughs> I, I, it is utterly, I'm sorry. I, I've, been, I've been accused of um, wanting to uh, set the NHS up to fail so that we can privatise it. Nothing could be further from the truth. M no, I am not a liar. I have, I have spent time volunteering in the NHS over four or five years. I am not a liar. I believe in the NHS. And so does my government. And so does my government. And we do put more money into it. We put an extra three... We, I'm sorry. I'm going, to have, I'm going to carry on answering this question. Right, let, let her finish. Uh, we yeah, are ending we, the programme. Just the last We have put an extra £3.5 billion in at the last budget. We've increased the NHS budget every year since we got into office. I do accept there's more demographic pressures on it. I do accept that. Um, that is true, but it is not true to say that we do not invest in the NHS and it is an utter lie to All say right. that we don't believe in it because right. we do. Thank you very much. Uh, our hour is up. I'm sorry, many of you wanted to get in on that, I know, and as always, but anyway, time is up. I've been